This way, Dr. Peterson, the man in the lab coat said, holding the doors open to let me inside the elevator. The interior was lit up with a soft blue glow, and like everything else in the Foundation headquarters, it was sleek and modern. The elevator looked futuristic, like something stolen from a science fiction movie, and I saw two thin metallic seats emerge from panels on the walls for us to rest on. But I didn't sit down. It was my first day, after all. I wanted to make a good impression. The elevator doors closed and the box began to descend rapidly, much faster than expected. Gum? Dr. Spencer asked, holding out a stick of Trident. You'll want some gum. No thanks. He looked at me for a moment longer with the stick of gum held out for me to take, but I didn't. Suit yourself. The box began to drop faster and faster, going down so quickly that my ears popped. Then they started to hurt. Dr. Spencer was looking at me and shaking his head. The pain was enormous, and it felt like my eardrums were about to explode. I fell to my knees in agony, screaming, clutching the sides of my skull. Told you to take some gum. The doors opened and my new boss stepped out, holding out his hand to show me the way forward. I stood up shakily, but was still struggling to recover for several long moments. Eventually, I managed to right myself and leave the elevator, following him through a vestibule, which led to a pair of doors. He pushed them open to reveal the largest and most futuristic looking warehouse I had ever seen. From the catwalk where we stood, we had a bird's eye view of it all, overlooking rows and rows of cubicles and storage containers stretching off for miles into the distance. It was like an underground city, so vast that the details of the furthest parts blurred and looked hazy, as if seen through a fog. But it was the uniqueness of each section that caught me off guard the most. There were thousands, if not millions of objects being stored there. Each one was housed in a very specific way, like jail cells built for supervillains. Some of the objects were the size of insects, while others were the size of elephants or even larger than that. They weren't grouped by size, but by some other organizational method which wasn't immediately obvious to me. People in Foundation uniforms walked around purposefully, some dressed in lab coats like us, while others were wearing black body armor and had guns on their belts indicating they were guards. I tried to take it all in, but it was impossible. There was so much to look at. I felt like I was visiting the biggest museum in the world, but only had a moment to see all of the exhibits. I realized my new boss was calling me to hurry up. Come on, there will be time to see everything soon enough. We have to finish the formalities, then we can take a tour. I followed him to another platform and stood with him on it. A second later, it started moving, floating through the air as if it were hovering. It took me a few seconds to realize we were, in fact, flying. Anti-gravity, Dr. Spencer said, as if this were the simplest thing in the world. This is the quickest way to the orientation session. The floating platform was making a whirring sound from below us, and there was a bright glow coming from the bottom of the vehicle as well. But it was far quieter than any of the hover technology or drones I had seen which were capable of lifting this sort of weight. Whatever mechanism it used to fly was years ahead of current technology. This whole underground laboratory felt like it existed decades in the future. Meanwhile, up above, people were carrying on as normal in the 21st century. I had heard rumors about the advanced tech possessed by the Foundation, but I had no idea it was so far beyond our current capabilities. Urgent voices began to call out from below, and I heard a shrill scream. Dr. Spencer didn't look worried, but he did take a second to speak into the communication device clipped to his lapel. A garbled voice spoke back, sounding nervous, but I couldn't make out the words. You'll have to bear with me for a moment. We need to make a brief stop, my boss said, fiddling with the control panel. I looked down to see a crowd was forming around one of the secure sections of the compound. There was smoke coming out from around the cracks of the door, and an alarm was emitting a shrill sound which grew louder as we got closer. Oh fuck, not again. Dr. Spencer muttered, sounding annoyed. It was the first time I heard the man swear. He'd been a picture of professionalism up until that point. Suddenly, I felt more nervous than ever. 
We settled down at a point just outside the room where the alarm was the loudest. The klaxon wailed urgently, piercing my ears, until my new boss hit a button on the control panel, causing it to decrease in volume slightly. The black smoke was heavy in the air here, and I started coughing and gagging on it. A second later, Dr. Spencer was handing me a mask which I put on my face. The air was breathable again, with a faint hint of new car smell. This is item number 9877, he said, his voice slightly muffled by the mask on his own face. It's one of our most valuable assets. It shows stock market fluctuations a full 24 hours in advance. This thing would be worth a fortune on the black market. It would also totally crash the economy and funnel everyone's hard-earned money into the pockets of whichever bastard oligarch was rich enough to afford its price tag. What's wrong with it? I asked, waving the smoke away from my face as we stepped inside the empty room. It's missing. That's what's wrong with it. A giant hole had been bored into the floor of the room from below, making it look like a giant electric drill had come up through the reinforced concrete. I thought this was the most secure facility on the planet. Who the hell could do something like this? The chaos insurgency. A man in a sharp looking black suit said, entering the room from behind us. It's always the fucking chaos insurgency. Chaos what now? Dr. Spencer took a tablet from the man and hit a button on the screen. The 2D surface of the device suddenly changed and became three-dimensional. A hologram appeared, floating in the air in front of us. It showed a strange looking device that reminded me a bit of a kaleidoscope, except with several panels and attachments. We believe they're making a run for Marshall Carter in dark, but it's definitely the chaos insurgency. Looks like they're trying to raise funds for an operation. What's Marshall Carter in dark? I asked. And what the hell is the chaos insurgency? There's no time. You'll find out in the orientation session, assuming you make it back. Hop on the hover lift. We're going after them. Wait, what? I tried to object, but the man in the black suit was talking over me. You'll have an emergency task force at your disposal. We'll be calling you Task Force Rapture. Details and equipment, along with reinforcements, will be following close behind. Do not engage until reinforcements arrive. Do you understand, Spencer? I don't want a repeat of last time. Yeah, yeah, anything else? Make sure the kid stays alive. We can't afford any more family payouts. What? No, listen, this is a big mistake. I said. It's my first day. I don't even have a weapon. Even better. The man in the suit said with a smile. You gotta get your feet wet sometime, Tiger. Go get them. Men in black references came to mind again, and I tried to shoo them away, wondering if we'd see a talking pug soon, or a pair of aliens nicknamed the Twins. Get on, Dr. Spencer said waving me back towards the hover platform. We gotta go. With several pairs of eyes watching me, I felt as if I had no choice but to go along with him. After all, this was what I signed up for, a life of secrets and danger. That was what you got when you joined the Foundation. I stepped onto the floating platform and it instantly began to move towards the room where the missing object had been located, squeezing tightly through the door frame with just a fraction of an inch on either side. The floating platform was morphing all around me, I realized. It was like liquid metal, changing its shape and creating a bubble around us. Within a few moments, the entire platform had converted into a sleek spaceship, complete with bucket seats and a display window. Dr. Spencer was already strapped in and patted the seat next to him, telling me to sit down. I took another second to marvel at the newly created compartment around me and noted again how it reminded me of a spaceship from a science fiction movie. Then I sat down next to him. As soon as I strapped on the safety belt, the ship plunged down into the hole which had been bored into the floor. My stomach dropped sickeningly as we began to turn sideways and barrel rolled through the zigzagging tunnel. It took us deeper and deeper into the depths of the earth and I wondered how much longer we would be riding on this nauseating roller coaster. Dr. Spencer began fiddling with the touchscreen controls on the display in front of him, pointing at what I realized was a digital map like an advanced radar system. It showed our progress as a blue circle as we traced a path towards the red blinking dot, which indicated the missing item. We were gaining on them quickly. They're not headed for the auction house, Spencer said into the comm unit attached to his lapel. Something's wrong. Alter contingency plan. And where the hell are those reinforcements? Our speed was increasing as we traveled faster and faster through the tunnel, 
the cracks and crevices in the earth turning into blurs as we plunged through the earth's crust and into molten rock below that. It felt like we were racing through hell as the glowing red mantle all around us reflected on our faces, casting us in crimson like demons. Where the fuck are we going? I asked. We're following the bleaking dot. Straight down to hell if we have to, said Dr. Spencer. Because if we don't, society will collapse. We need to get that item back, remember? At all costs. Jesus, okay. Whatever you need me to do, I'll do it. Good. They're going deeper. And that means this is not a route back to their base or to the auction house. They must be heading somewhere else. Maybe to make a deal with someone. Another blinking dot appeared on the screen. This one colored green. It was following behind us at a much slower rate. There's our backup, finally. The ship plunged through a hole in the lava and we entered a huge cavernous space. Jagged shards of igneous rocks were everywhere, their pointed ends stretching out in front of us, almost grazing the ship's hull as we passed through their midst. We were floating through a halo of daggers, their sharp points teasing us from inches away. As we neared the epicenter of the enormous space, existing impossibly in the mantle of the earth, molten lava could be seen at the peripheries of this strange pocket world. Up ahead, a cavern was floating in the air, spinning ever so slightly. They're gonna wake up an ancient. Spencer said into his comm device. I can't believe they could be this stupid. Shit, get in there. There's no time for backup. You need to stop them now, before they can reach it. Dr. Spencer punched a few buttons on the control panel as we settled on the rocks just outside the cave. The entrance was too narrow for the vehicle, and I saw another similar craft had been abandoned nearby. I guessed it belonged to the members of the Chaos Insurgency who had stolen the item from the warehouse. This isn't the first time they've managed to take a piece of technology from us, my new boss explained. Several months ago, they managed to take one of our nanometal ships, the same type of vehicle we're using right now. This technology can be programmed to do nearly anything, and those bastards have rigged theirs up to rain hell on us ever since they managed to hijack it. We need to make sure they don't take that vehicle with them, but first and foremost, we need to stop them from waking the ancient. What is it? I asked. And how are we going to get to it? It must be a million degrees Fahrenheit out there. No one who has seen an ancient has lived to tell about it, so I don't know exactly what we'll encounter. But these suits should help with the temperature. The living metal surrounding us drooped and sagged, portions of it ballooning into pockets which surrounded us, then separating from the ship. These nanometal balloons shrunk around us to form perfectly molded suits with helmets that filtered the air coming in and out and cooled us to room temperature. Then the door of the craft opened up and let us out. I was terrified of stepping outside at first, but then followed with some hesitation as Dr. Spencer led me towards the mouth of the cave, handing me a weapon. The safety is off. It won't kill the ancient or even hurt it, but it will damage its guardians. And a few well-placed shots will kill members of the Chaos Insurgency if you manage to hit them. Don't hesitate to fire on sight. They would do the same to you. This place does not permit visitors. And the closer you get to the Ancient, the more the cave will try to stop you from proceeding. If we're lucky, we won't even need to stop these guys. This place will do it for us. How long do we have until reinforcements arrive? Not long enough. This is gonna be up to us. We stepped inside the dark cavern, and the blackness swallowed us up immediately. Lights came on automatically, situated on top of our visors and on our weapons. Still, it was difficult to see. The darkness was oppressive. Up ahead, you see them? Spencer asked. I looked where he was pointing and saw the creatures. They were sitting on the floor with their backs against walls or crouching down, scattered around the next section of the cave. From where we were standing, they looked like people. But as we got closer, I saw they were deformed and misshapen, their features rotten and skin sagging. What are they? I asked. They are the fallen ones the warriors who came to this place before us, only to fall against the Ancient One and its guardians. People have actually been in here before? How? This place is in the middle of literal hell. Civilizations long before us had far greater knowledge and technology than we could ever give them credit for. Thousands of years ago, there were cities with flying cars and other advanced equipment that today we would imagine as science fiction. Like the nanometal ship, for instance. We borrowed that idea from an ancient text we dug up. Everyone has a false preconception about ancient people, that they are stupid, 
when in fact they were much more intelligent than we could ever hope to be. Isn't that just more of a red flag that we should get out of here? If those geniuses died in here, aren't we completely fucked? This place will kill those bad guys faster than we ever could, if it's as dangerous as you say it is. Not with the nanometal suits and the item they have in their possession. If manipulated correctly, it will allow them to make all the correct decisions, leading them directly to the Ancient. But it will also allow us to follow them. We're still tracking them with the implanted chip. There was a display panel on his arm, which showed the same radar image we'd seen inside the vehicle. Our blinking blue dot following a little ways behind the red one. The walls of the cavern were outlined as well, and I saw this was a labyrinth, an impossibly vast maze with only one way in or out. If you need something, just think about it, and the suit will make it into existence. As long as it can be made out of metal, simple items like blades, for instance, the suit will make it for you. The nanotechnology is capable of picking up on your brainwaves. I felt a slithering strand of the liquid metal crawling into my ear and fought off the urge to scream. The nanometal was going right into my brain so that it could read my thoughts and provide me assistance and essentially making me into the T-1000. Let's go, Spencer said and began to race towards the creatures. The humanoid creatures stood from the shadows quickly and raised their weapons to fight. Their grayish faces looked like zombies and I realized that was a good comparison for them. Rotting flesh hung from them where old battle wounds had never healed. Several were missing arms or feet, but they made up for this with their sheer fury and anger. It felt like we had just invaded the den of a pack of hungry lions. They pounced on us, brandishing their spears. Several of the blades came flying at me, as well as an arrow which deflected off my armored chest. The nanometal began to smoke and sizzle in the place where it made its impact, and for a while the suit looked defective as it began to cast off sparks and emit flashing pulses of light. Uh, how strong are these suits exactly? I asked Spencer. His own suit had a few scars now as well, and was pulsing with white light. They're strong enough. Now shoot them! I didn't need to be asked twice. I raised the gun he'd given me and began to fire at the walking corpses, aiming for their heads. They were coming at me so fast that by the time I shot one, sending it stumbling backwards, there would be another one just inches away. Blades! We need blades! He said, dropping his gun. His nanometal suit sprouted a blade from the end of each of his arms, replacing his hands. He began to swing them like Baraka, grunting with effort as he decapitated each of the undead guardians as they came at him. Following his lead, I did the same. I dropped my gun and put all of my mental energy into picturing two long blades, one emerging from each wrist of my suit. The nanometal squirmed in my ear, seeming satisfied with my request, as if it had a primal thirst for blood that needed to be quenched. A moment later, the sharpened blades appeared, extending from my wrists, stopping at exactly where I imagined they should. The zombies were attacking me from behind, and I spun with an attack, channeling all of my old military training. I swung the blades at the creatures' heads and lopped off several of them, sending them tumbling into the dark recesses of the cave. Within a few minutes, all of them were dead. We don't have much time. They'll start to regenerate, Dr. Spencer said, grabbing his gun and leading me forward. I took a look back over my shoulder and wished later that I hadn't. All of the dismembered body parts from the things we had killed were sprouting tiny legs like insects. They began to march the arms, legs, hands, and heads back together, resembling the army of corpses. Oh, fuck! We need to run! I said, breaking into a jog. My new boss grabbed my arm, pulling me back to his side. No, that's exactly what this place wants you to do. They won't follow us. That's their station. There will be more up ahead. We need to be rested for when we see them. We don't want to run into them and wake them up, just to be surrounded by them. Think, you might have to do this by yourself one day. Try to watch me, okay? I'm the best the Foundation has. I gave him a look that probably said he was full of himself. Look. I know how that sounds, but it's true. The boss tells me all the time I'm the best they've got. They'd be screwed without me. Some days I feel like I'm the only thing keeping that place together. Hence why we brought you on board. I can't do this forever. For some reason this made me more nervous than anything yet. The fact that one man could be holding the world together and stopping society from crumbling on a daily basis. It was terrifying to consider. Status update. We have passed the first Guardians. Moving on to Section 2. There was no response. Damn it. We must be too deep. Our tech is good, 
but the ancient is too strong. It must be blocking our signal somehow. I followed after him, alarm bells ringing in my mind for some reason I couldn't figure out. Something about this situation was off. It felt like we were being led into a trap. Although I mentioned this to Dr. Spencer, he didn't take it seriously. Trap or not, we've got to get that device back. And we can't let them use whatever is inside of it as a bargaining chip with the Ancient. Who knows what they might ask for, and what wishes it might grant. What do you mean? What's inside of the device? Something so powerful, it can manipulate the flow of time. That is an exceptional power. And I have no doubt that the device itself is only a disguise for whatever is truly hiding within it. An ancient technology or a magical crystal not from this world. It's impossible to say without looking at it and analyzing it. And so far, we haven't even been able to get the damn thing open. The next group of guardians could be seen up ahead. They looked like monsters made of rocks. Giants at least 15 feet tall or more. There were curved horns atop their heads and their faces were hideous and gargoyle-like. They didn't bother to hide in the shadows like the previous group. Instead, they stood out in the open, waiting for us to approach. Ah, humans, one of them said, crossing its arms across its broad chest. You should run now while you still can. The ancient one sleeps, and you would be foolish to disturb his slumber. The last time he was awoken, so many died. Your history books burned with the rest of the world, erasing your memories. Everything and everyone burned. Do you wish to die in flame and ash as well, little ones? I looked over at Dr. Spencer and was surprised to see that he looked nervous. Despite how much experience he had, this place was terrifying to both of us. That made me feel even more scared. But a second later, he put his hand on my shoulder and began to speak confidently. We've only got one shot at this, he said. Every task force member carries one of these, just in case. What is it? I asked, looking at the round object in his hand. I don't want to scare you. Just pull the pin when I tell you and throw it. Try to land it in the middle of all of them. I'll do my best to make them group together. A second later, he was running toward the crowd of stone giants. He fired his weapon at them ineffectually, and I saw the powerful blasts were no match for these monsters. A few chunks of rock broke off from the shoulder of one of them, and it let out an annoyed grunt, but that was the most damage he could do with it. Still, the desired effect was accomplished. There were about a dozen of the creatures, and they were spread throughout the next wide section of the cavern. But as Dr. Spencer fired his weapon, they all began to race toward him, their powerful strides causing the ground beneath us to shake violently, small stones raining down from the ceiling above. He retreated as soon as they started toward him, running back at me as fast as he could. The creatures were slow at first, but they picked up speed as they gained momentum. One reached down for him, nearly grabbed him, but he put on a burst of quickness at the last second and evaded it. Now! Spencer screamed. Throw it! My hands were trembling as I fumbled for the pin. For several long seconds, I couldn't get a grip on it and worried it was stuck. But then it came free and I quickly launched it through the air like an outfielder trying to throw out a runner at home plate. <laughs> The metallic sphere bounced with a loud noise, clanging off the rocky floor of the cavern. Nothing happened for a few long moments as the giant creatures continued racing toward us. And then there was a very loud boom. A shockwave bloomed outwards from the epicenter where the odd looking grenade had landed. I covered my ears and felt the suit do the same, blocking out the sound wave so that I didn't go completely deaf from the blast. The explosion was a small white dot at first, the size of the head of a pin, but then it began to spin and grow, absorbing everything around it. All of the creatures running toward us stopped mid-stride and began to slide backwards across the stone floor of the cavern. As more matter was absorbed into the speck of light, it ballooned into a glowing orb the size of a basketball, and then a car. It stopped growing in size, and the center of the orb turned dark. Singularity grenade! Dr. Spencer explained, yelling to be heard over the noise. It creates a temporal field at 50 yards and will self-extinguish once all available matter has been absorbed. The miniature black hole suddenly contracted with a deafening whoosh, shrinking in size until it was a glowing white pinpoint in the air once again. A few seconds later, it disappeared completely, leaving a massive empty sphere where it had been. Everything, including the monsters and the cavern around them were gone, and we had to traverse through a steep valley to go forward. Okay, let's hope we didn't waste our chance. We need to hurry now. They're getting away from us. 
Spencer said, looking at the display screen on the wrist of his suit. The chamber should be just up ahead. Be ready for anything. This is insane, I muttered. We're gonna die in there, aren't we? Ideally, no. I'll do everything I can to get us out of here safely. I've still got a few tricks up my sleeve, kid. Trust me. We entered the next chamber, and my eyes widened at the sight before me. There was a coiled body resembling a huge snake, and at first, I thought that was what the ancient was, a serpent longer than a hundred city buses. But then my eyes traced the winding path of it, and I saw its face and the wings, and realized it was a dragon, massive and orange, striped and flecked with red in a pattern similar to a cat. It was slumbering on a low pedestal, surrounded by molten lava, which was flowing steadily around it like a river, steaming bubbles blooming and popping on the surface. Standing at the edge of this river of fire was a single man, wearing a suit which looked very much like the ones we were wearing. No, it can't be, Spencer said, stumbling forward towards the man. I thought you were dead. Ah, my old partner, said the man who was waiting for us. Somehow I knew they would send you. The very best the Foundation has to offer. Who else would they trust to save the planet yet again? It was you all along. You were the double agent. You were the one who gave them the location of the warehouse. Finally figured it out, eh? The man said, clapping sarcastically. But he held something firmly in his hands while he did so. The device. Give it to me, Spencer said, pointing his weapon at the man. I'm only going to tell you once. They locked eyes for a split second longer. And then the man flung the device over his shoulder into the steaming pool of lava. Spencer screamed and ran forward, looking ready to dive into the molten lava to retrieve it. I stopped him grabbing his arm and yelling at him to stop. Somehow I knew that if he dove in there, it would kill him. I must have been right about that, since he didn't put up much of a fight. He instead raised his gun to fire at the other man. Three bolts of energy hit the man square in the chest, and he smiled as a gaping, basketball-sized hole was seared through him, showing the molten lava glowing on the other side. Blood poured from his mouth as his grin grew wider, before he fell to his knees and collapsed on his face, dead. The lava began to bubble and churn where the item had been thrown into it. And suddenly the enormous dragon's eyes popped open as it awoke from its long rest. Creatures began to emerge from the lava, stepping out from the molten flow, carrying spears and swords made of igneous rock, still dripping liquid fire and hardening in their hands. All around us the cavern was shaking and rocks were falling from the ceiling, impacting with huge crashes nearby. The dragon was uncoiling itself slowly, like a massive knot being untied by invisible hands. Its wings began to flap as it took flight, moving impossibly through the air and up toward the high ceiling above us. It broke through the rock and boulders tumbled all around us, landing on the creatures staggering toward us and crushing them. I heard Spencer yelling something into his comm device. I'm not sure what it was, but he sounded as desperate as I felt. The nanometal ship suddenly came through the hole in the ceiling above and swooped down to scoop us up just as a massive chunk of rock landed where we had been a second prior. The nanometal sealed up around us in a protective bubble and our suits were reabsorbed back into it, reinforcing the outer shell which now kept us safe. We shot out of the hole in the ceiling of the cavern just as the entire structure collapsed. The other nanometal ship fell downwards into the molten abyss. What about the other ship? I asked. We need to get it back. Spencer just shook his head. It doesn't matter now. None of it matters anymore. He showed me the radar display and pointed to several new dots which were blinking and glowing on its surface. The Chaos Insurgency is invading the warehouse as we speak. They knew I would try to stop the Ancient, that I would chase after the item. They planned all of it perfectly. They were two steps ahead of us right from the beginning. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. So all of this? It was a diversion? Something like that. The tunnel they dug to steal the item. They used it to bring in more reinforcements. They must have reverse engineered the nanometal, just like we did. They built a fleet. What about the Ancient? The Guardian said it would destroy everything. Don't they care? He shook his head. The Chaos Insurgency doesn't care about anything. I don't think they have the slightest clue what they just unleashed. To them, it was just a good way to distract the Foundation's best task force leader. At that exact moment, another ship emerged, entering the pocket beneath the Earth's crust where we were currently hovering. The snake-like body of the giant dragon was wriggling through the air high above us. 
looking ready to attack us and make a morning meal out of us at any second. I'm at a loss. We either stay and try to battle against this unstoppable ancient, or we go back to the warehouse and try to defend it. What do you think we should do, kid? You're asking me? It's my first day on the job. This is way too much pressure. The world was going to end, and now the only person capable of stopping it was asking me for advice? I started hyperventilating, feeling as if I were having a panic attack. So you can't decide? I shook my head, struggling to breathe, the world fading to black around the edges. Too bad. You were so close, kid. Okay. Simulation complete. Suddenly, the lava world around us disappeared. The dragon, the pocket world, and the mantle of the earth. All of it was gone, and we were standing in the elevator again. The same one we had used to descend down into the warehouse. Except I realized that we were still going downwards, as if the place we were headed to was far, far deeper below ground than expected. What I had mistaken at first for seats were actually holographic projectors, which had been creating the illusion of the terrifying experience we'd just been through, making it feel very real. You really blew it, kid, Spencer said, shaking his head. All you had to do was tell the rest of the task force to stay and fight the Ancient using singularity grenades, while the two of us went back to stop the invasion at the warehouse. I spelled it all out for you. I gave it to you on a silver platter. You were so close. The elevator doors finally opened for real, and Dr. Spencer stepped off. Behind him, I could see the warehouse, exactly as it had appeared in the simulation. It was so advanced, the technology could replicate sights, sounds, and smells, not to mention the pain of being hit by an arrow. I tried to step off of the elevator to follow my new boss, but he put his hands up, stopping me. That was the last part of the job interview. Step five, real world simulated situation, and you failed. The Foundation will not be requiring your services at this time. Best of luck in your future endeavors. With that, the elevator doors closed and the box began to ascend, bringing me back up to the regular world. I couldn't believe it. Maybe one day they'll let me reapply. More than anything, I want to work for the Foundation, to secure, to contain, to protect. If you crave more thrilling SCP adventures, don't miss out on the SCP Experience podcast, where you'll find a treasure trove of over 230 episodes. Click the link in the description to immerse yourself in the captivating world of SCP mysteries. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy these stories, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out some more of my episodes here.